Thank you so much. Um, so, you know, uh, first of all, hello, everyone. And uh, it is really heartening to see that, to see your support for ETCFO, uh, you know, through your presence since morning. So thank you so much for that. Thank you for sticking with us. And, you know, it's your presence uh, that, you know, encourages and pushes us to do better each day. So thank you so much. Uh, now, moving on to our panel, uh, you know, we have a really interesting panel today, and the discussion is, are startups building the next India Inc? Uh, so, you know, uh, starting with uh, Mr. Pathak, uh, you know, India is the third largest startup ecosystem uh, in the world after US and China. So, while India has become a fertile ground for sunicorns and unicorns, uh, how do you see India Inc. Uh, evolving in the next five to ten years? Hi, good evening. So, uh, you know, that's a very interesting question. You know, we have been seeing that a uh, lot of uh, unicorns have come up uh, recently. And, uh, in fact, I was going through some data also. If I'm not wrong, there's 100 plus unicorns in India as we speak sometime, announced sometime last month. And uh, in last uh, two years or one and a half year, it's been more than 60 unicorns out of it. So which the point which I'm trying to uh, bring up is that almost, uh, say, 60% of the unicorns in India have come up in the last one and a half year, which means that the environment is totally conducive for unicorns and for the startups, and uh, the policies are probably supportive. That's what I, we can see. And while I come from an organization currently which is not a startup, I have been in past associated with some of the startups and different capacities. So in next five to 10 years, if uh, you know the thing, the way we are moving on, the, poli the way environment, the, the policies are there, government policies, the conducive environment, and uh, if you talk about uh, the overall business opportunities which India is offering as compared uh, with, you know, even we see that you know, there have been negative situations like COVID situation or the war, et cetera, have been going on despite that. And, so despite that, you know, we have the lot of opportunities which are coming up in India. So next five to ten years could be excellent for uh, unicorns and sonicorns, as we say. That's what I feel here. Uh, you know what, on the numbers side, uh, in the last six years, uh, if we talk about registered startups, from 700, uh, we registered 14,000 startups uh, in FI21. Yeah. And you know, uh, Alone uh, in FY21, we had 83 unicorns. Uh, so, you know, some unicorn CFO sitting here with us as well. So, you know, uh, taking the same question with you, Mr. Bansal, uh, you know, uh, how do you see India Inc. evolving in the next five to ten years? I think it's an exciting time for the entire startup ecosystem in India. What happened in the last decade was the startups came into the mainframe earlier. If I talk about in 2010, there was nothing where I would be really excited to know about a startup. Uh, I think the next decade is the decade where these startups will play a very important role in the overall growth story of India. It's a golden opportunity for India, uh, the entire next decade, and startups will play a very important role uh, in that entire journey. I think overall, how will the ecosystem will shape up. My view is India is still a very consumption-led story. So all startups which would help drive consumption through basic stuff, saying convenience, accessibility, and affordability, they're going to thrive in the next entire decade. If you look at the largest of the startups in current ecosystem, you have the e-commerce players, food delivery guys, and cab aggregators. That is one set of startups which will thrive. The others uh, are startups which are built in India, but for global clientage. The likes of uh, SaaS companies. Again, we have two distinct advantages. One being a low uh, cost base, and the other is the super talented tech talent which we have in India. So uh, we should see a lot more fresh works and postman coming out of India in the next decade. And third, I believe there will be certain surprises. If I have to take a bet, I think health tech and uh, space tech should be those two sectors which would essentially be surprising us uh, in the next decade. And health is one area I'm personally very, very 
uh, passionate about and i believe uh, this country needs a lot of investment in that area and startups now can play a very important role in bringing tech to that sector and then improving the overall health outcomes of uh, we as in indians i think with these three ecosystem as they flourish they will shape up how indian inc looks like in the next 5 to 10 years all right so uh, you know on that note i'll move to mr chug and uh, mr chug i would like to understand that you know uh, india inc uh, is now evolving with new players entering the field and you know uh, last year we saw a slew of uh, ipos happening uh, to bring another uh, you know uh, data point here uh, around 89000 uh, crore rupees uh, of you know uh, was raised in ipos by 75 uh, new entrants last year so you know uh, when we talk about this uh, how do you describe this wave or trend of uh, you know unicorns or uh, companies entering the bosses oh, thank you uh, i think it's about time right uh, very exciting time indeed right and this is something which has been happening globally uh, for a while now uh, again there are success stories and, and not so successful ipos there as well uh, and same we are seeing in india also uh, but i think these are very interesting times uh, for, for a couple of reasons uh, i think a it opens up another avenue of financing for the startups uh, for the investors you know it's an exit option for for employees is a wealth creation opportunity so i think it opens another avenue where we believe that startups are still not profitable but have have immense growth potential uh, going forward there's still a avenue of going to the market raising money from you know large investors retail investors uh, uh, great times i think the second thing and uh, something which which i have i've heard of late that for for the potential candidates for ipos right and they have to be ipo ready and and what it means that you know they have started working on on building a more sustainable uh they have a path to profitability you now while they you know while growing uh, at the pace that they're growing uh there has increased focus on corporate governance increased focus on you know creating predictability for the organization for the investors so i think it is it is bringing a much needed maturity in the ecosystem and of course uh any any good things will will also have some some not so good things so we have seen uh, some of the, the uh, organizations or some of the ipos coming in uh, eroding uh, some part of the retail retail wealth but i think as the ecosystem grows as as we understand what you know and as we understand the newer business models better how to value them better i think there will be more more rationality we will let go of the exuberance we have seen in some of the ipos but overall i think it's a great great positive for the ecosystem uh, as a whole thank you for your input sir uh, so mr bansal uh, can you uh, tell us that you know how is the investment landscape uh, changed in india i think again uh, if we go back 10 years around a decade back there were very very few global investors who were investing in indian startup uh, story and there were hardly anyone in the domestic uh, sector who was investing in startups except mr sandeep vikchandani he was the only one who was a believer even 15 years back of the entire <coughs> success story uh the entire last decade was dominated by foreign investors uh, where most of the larger vcs have entered india and have invested substantially in the entire uh, indian startup ecosystem uh with that uh, what has happened i think in the last 5 years we have seen a lot of angel investors coming into play now though the capital they invest is fairly fairly small how does that change the entire ecosystem is there was a vacuum in terms of where there were large vcs but there were essentially no one to fund the seed stage setups so if you talk to me today i don't see a challenge where a good business idea can't get a seed stage funding so they close that vacuum and that also is one of the reason where you see this number of 700 turning to a good 14 15000 ka number uh, <clears throat> what that led to people started understanding this ecosystem and who were these people these were people successful startup co-founders 
senior executives at startups or now senior executives at uh, larger or organizations. That led to family offices, large family offices enter into startup uh, investment uh, ecosystem and that has been continuing for last two, three years. You see a lot of now multiple family offices investing in mid-size to late-stage startups. And post that now you have India-specific funds, the like of Kotak and IFL, who have built out India-specific one, money raised in India for the Indian startups. So all these three put together, there is a significant amount of domestic capital which has started going into startups. Now, once these people start getting some kind of exit, uh, because it's already four, five years, these people have started investing, you will see this money flowing back into the startup ecosystem and with much fervor and increased intensity. So, though the last decade was primarily dominated by foreign investors, which will be the case in the next, we need that FDI, we do not have that level of capital in India as of now. But a significant portion of investment will come in from domestic investors that will create more wealth within the Indian ecosystem. Right. So now that we've uh, established that, you know, uh, what the investment ecosystem looks like and also, uh, you know, where the India Inc. is, uh, what's the new India, how the new India Inc. is shaping up, uh, let's move on to uh, how, you know, startups are looking at growth. So on that note, I'll bring you, uh, Mr. Chug, you know, you're the CFO of OLX India. So, you know, uh, physical work or knowledge work, how are Tire 2 and Tire 3 cities powering growth for you? And what are the challenges ahead of you while, you know, you are planning your growth strategy? Uh See, both from, from the business perspective, I think I've been in the organization where tier two, tier three markets have, have proven to be good, a good market for us in terms of, you know, uh, supporting the overall growth of the organization. Uh, but, but purely speaking uh, from the manpower or, or the talent uh, perspective, I think uh, tier two, tier three markets have been uh, instrumental in uh, you know, scaling up. They've been actually been pivotal to to our talent acquisition uh, strategy, uh, specifically at the uh, uh, middle and lower uh, management segment. And specifically, I've worked in law, large transaction businesses. So it means that you know we have to start building in bridges where we can bring in the talent from tier two, tier three cities in, in tier one to you know help uh, support the scale which we were uh, looking at. Uh, it's not easy to get the, the required talent, specifically at the lower and middle level talent within the tier one given the competition we have. So I think as organizational, uh, uh, we have spent a lot of time in you know bringing that talent, uh, both in terms of you know, uh, uh, you know know providing the, the sheer man, man force uh, for us to, to scale and uh, you know meet the talent requirements, as well as I think from the knowledge work perspective, uh, a lot of times we have seen that you know there are there are a lot of work or there are a lot of manpower uh, you know workforce which comes from tier two tier two tier two tier three cities colleges there institutions which have been built there so we have been we have been extremely focused on these these markets for our talent uh, acquisition strategy. All right, sir. So uh, you know moving on to Mr. Pathak, Mr. Pathak. Uh, you have over two decades of experience and you have risen from a background of a. Uh, head legal and compliance and uh, you know to a finance chief so you know managing not only administration but uh, but you were also managing uh, you know compliance systems and processes and governance and all of those uh, uh, words you know hold heavy heft in uh, you know for a CFO so you know what does all of that mean today and uh, Specifically, when we talk about systems and processes, when we talk about compliance, when we talk about governance, when the world around us is changing so rapidly. Also, you know, technology is now taking over. And in our previous discussions before this panel, we have touched on this point as well, that now that technology is taking over most of the compliance burden for us, uh, CFOs are now more free to manage and strategize. So, you know, can you decode the learnings for new players entering India Inc. from the perspective of what is ahead of uh, for these companies when they scale up at hyper growth and how can they manage it timely and efficiently? 
So, uh, if you talk about uh, compliances, systems, processes, governance, they are part of life of the any company. And as we grow as an organization, you know, if I talk about the life cycle of an organization, say starting from a private limited organization to a public limited company, then we, you know, raise public funds, become a listed organization. The kind of uh, compliances or regulations which are applicable to such organization keep on changing. Private companies are exempted from a lot of provisions of companies that they may not be required to comply with. Once you become public limited, you know, they are becoming applicable. You have to be more, uh, you know, assured of that, you know, those compliances are being t undertaken while making any corporate action. And when you become listed, you know, you are, there are a lot of SEBI regulations which become applicable. And this is all apart the other regulators which may be applicable to your nature of business, whether it be it RBI or IRDA or any other authority. So uh, while technology may be taking over this thing, the overall responsibility is on the key manager person who is the CFO or company secretary of the company or head legal or whatever role, whatever name we may, uh, we may call. But uh, the person who is responsible for those is the person who is accountable. So a constant watch has to be kept. And we heard Mr. Raghav earlier also in the previous session where he when, uh, asked about the time he spent, he was focusing on governance as an important aspect of a, uh, of a CFO. The time spent on that aspect is very important. So, uh, you know, I just maybe uh, I, can, I can share some example like, you know, moving, a, a comparing a life of a startup or a company with, uh, you know, comparing with life of an individual, just on a lighter side, it also moves like same. A startup is like a young person, early 20s, just came out of college, looking for exploring, full of energy, and, you know, not knowing any rules or not trying to break the rules or trying to come out of any, you know, uh, defined practices as such. So similarly, a startup also. But when you become a slightly mature, you have raised funds, now the accountability comes in. You are accountable to your investors, just like a mature 30-year-old person would be. And if you move to the stage of listing, where you're the public shareholders, and on the individual side, you're getting married. So a lot of other responsibilities coming in. You are responsible to your family. You're responsible to your relatives. And similarly, company is responsible for the public shareholders, the regulators, other stakeholders, which may include your customers, employees, vendors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is an important part of a life uh, of a organization and uh, can't be included as such and totally we have to take a overall responsibility in managing these things. Right, thank you so much for those uh, responses. Uh, so you know, there's one common question that I would like to explore with all three of you. And I know that you know, in our conversation with the CFOs when we are doing stories, this has uh, come up a lot of time that, you know, one challenge for CFOs today is finding the right talent. So, uh, you know, when we talk about the next India Inc., so, uh, you know, what will it take to upscale and uh, reskill and find the talent needed for this next India Inc. or new India Inc. Uh, in the next five to ten years? We can start with Mr. Chug. Thank you. I think it's a very, very pertinent question and uh, close to, to my heart. Uh, I think the simple answer is overall the education system, you know, to match the industry demand, something we read in our business studies books. Uh, but I think whatever I've seen in New York lately, I think there's a lot of changes happening in the way, you know, uh, there are, there are, in MBA schools, there are startup focused programs, you know, there are data science product management programs which have started. So slowly and steadily there is being progress being made and which is again, I think a long journey and, and may help us solve it in the longer run. Uh, I have also seen some of the category leaders uh, among the startups. They have, you know, uh, have ties with the local government institutions, ITIs, set up their own academies. Uh, so this has been specifically helpful at the at the lower level of the, you know, the, the massive workforce journey they, they start to require. So I think there are there are a lot of changes happening uh, at that level. Uh, what I'm, I'm still still concerned about, uh, again, sharing from personal experiences on the mid management layer. So I've generally seen that, you know, a lot of, lot of people uh, within finance and other functions as well, they've been quite stagnant at the middle management, you know, working in small siloed roles and not understanding what, what exactly is changing. And the world is changing every quarter, every every six months. Uh, for that thing, uh, the only advice I have is to take chances. Uh, a bit controversy, but move through stints within the organization or outside the organization, learn what is happening, be, be closer to product, align to the group vision, you know, align to the product visions of the organization, understand how can product enable what you do and, you know, 
uh, how can you further enable the business in that perfect step? So I think it, it requires a tremendous change uh, at that specifically at the middle management level to be able to take chances, you know, move to smaller organizations, learn more, do more, move behind the traditional uh, finance bits if required. So, yeah. All right. So, Mr. Patak, uh, what do you uh, think about this question? And, you know, also, just to slightly tweak your question, how uh, would you cultivate that kind of talent within the organization? So, I equal uh, sentiments of uh, Sumit. And, uh, you know, the couple of things which I can share here is that hiring process is very important. While you are hiring at that time itself, you know, we can see the background, the zeal to learn and, uh, you know, how we can handhold the candidate for uh, taking up a particular position role. And uh, in uh, any organization who, is, who has just started the business or in, in the initial years, when they're short of cash or they want to conserve the funds, finances, the idea is to outsource certain activities. So a overlap with the outsource agency practically helps, you know, while building up the team, internal teams also. And that's what we have also done in the past experiences. Uh, second thing is, on apart from the hiring and after that, on upskilling, you know, when we, I feel that uh, it is important that we are in the growth stage. We need to be, we need to have some multi-skill people who can not, they are not, you know, uh, like, work, like uh, Sumit said, working in silos or working in compartments. So, should be free enough to move around, look for additional activities apart from their routine role. So, it's not that, you know, limited to the KRA part, but you know, what else they can do, what's the, the other additional responsibilities they can take on the organization and how fruitful, you know, how, uh, the, what is the output, overall output they can deliver. So, understanding that and providing the right kind of training around that, that will be helpful. Uh, in fact, when we do this, this also helps in retention because it also increases the job satisfaction for the talent and, you know, will help in, indirectly help in retention as well. All right. And uh, uh, Mr. Bansal? I think we have women's talent in India, right? Uh, though there are certain structural changes which uh, what Sumit spoke about around education system, I think the next generation want to try out different stuff. So till the time you keep on giving them good quality work, that's where the skilling and upskilling is going to happen. And as a policy or as a practice, the more you revolve them through different roles and responsibilities and give them more challenging tasks, they are more than happy to do it. Versus someone, when we were in our age, we used to be in a very comfort zone, which they do not like to be. If you give them repetitive work, they'll want to move out very, very quickly. So. I think giving them more and more responsibility, making them do different things. And third thing which I've realized is this generation loves to work in ambiguity. They do not like rules. So if you bring them in a very, very structured setup, they get bored very easily. They do not, they feel like a rule book, if they have to follow a rule book, they, are, they will be the last person to be working on that. So, let them operate in ambiguous circumstances. Let them figure out ways and means of working and figuring out their path of how do they want to shape up their career. And I think as the startup ecosystem grows, we will see a lot of talent coming out from there itself, both for the next set of jobs as well as entrepreneurs. Because if we look at out of the 100 startups we have spoken, I don't know how many, but the next wave of startups happened with Flipkart employees because they made money and then they started another journey of. So large startups, early stage startups, I think the level of exposure they will, uh, employees will get there is something, uh, yeah, one should look for. I think in the current times, you not only have millennials, but Gen Z as your employee as well as your customers. So I think that's the tricky part that I think all the CFOs have to consider. Uh, so, you know, I think uh, we can open the stage for some questions. So if the audience has any question for our panel, uh, kindly let us know. Hi, uh, my name is Aditya. My question is, um, there's a lot of buzz around productivity today, right? And when we've spoken a lot about, you know, the right hiring and, you know, retention of talent, et cetera, right? Uh, but productivity today is as much as important as, you know, hiring the right talent and retaining them. 
So from a financial standpoint, do you think productivity of employees is something that sort of falls into the discussion point of a CFO's agenda today? So any of you wants to take that question? Definitely, yes. I think, how do you measure productivity? So, for me, it's hard to define KPIs for every single employee who works in the org. But my only way of looking at that would be, if I hire a new person, what additional stuff is going to happen? Either it, uh, in terms of incremental revenue, or in terms of a cost reduction happening, or building an altogether new capability. If any of these three criteria are met, I think uh, that answers for productivity. I would not go by any specific metric saying this KPI has to be met for a specific employee. So my question goes to Mr. Patak. Uh, so you mentioned that as the company grows, we start having more regulations in tune with the business. So sir, what do you think? Are these regulations going to help the companies in business? Or do they act as a hindrance for the companies to grow? Uh, if I have a startup, I am not regulated by many authorities. But as I grow, I would be regulated, started being regulated by NCLT and different authorities as well. And if I'm looking for some public funding, uh, I would also be come under regulation of SEBI. So do you think it acts as a hindrance for my business to grow or not? So, uh, see, it will not be hindrance as such. I will say that it is a part of the procedure. If you are looking for larger funds, if you are looking for public funds, then the accountability automatically comes in. There is a disclosure requirements of SEBI, there are reporting requirements, you know, we have to follow certain rules, regulations, taking, uh, you know, approvals for the related party transactions, if you are doing transactions between the group companies. Or if you are, you know, uh, raising any funds, then there is a SEBI ICDI regulation, SEBI, other regulations, capital disclosure regulations, etc. So, you know, uh, definitely it will increase the timelines for uh, doing a transaction and that you may consider as a hindrance, but from a public perspective, from an overall economic perspective, it is good to have those regulations because it uh, instills confidence in public when you are raising funds that, uh, you know, the, if a company is compliant, is rated well on those. If we have, we have been seeing a lot of companies who have good uh, corporate governance ratings, etc., and we always like to invest them passively also through stock exchanges in them. So that's, I will, I will not uh, term this as a hindrance as such. Hi, this is Ankur. Uh, we are in, um, you know, uh, inflationary uh, trend and um, we are seeing wage hikes, especially in the ITs, uh, the IT people, so, you know, wage increments and it's tremendously going high. So in this situation and startups, you know, uh, loaded with a lot of funds and extra funding, how are you kind of, you know, managing your budgets and, you know, matching up to that and then, you know, uh, meeting the expectation of the shareholders and, and because normally when you you know, go for funding, you sh kind of we show a good picture that, okay, this is a growth, but then the cost is, you know, impacting the whole cash burn. So how are you managing? So, yeah, anyone can help me. So I think uh, one thing which I've, I've learned through the cycle is, you know, uh, when there are not enough funds available, your prioritization becomes very strong. And I've generally seen that that's a, that's a good thing for the business in the long run because you have really sharp focus on what you want to deliver, which can be growth growth or a mix of uh, certain profitability metrics you're chasing. But the way we manage a budget is that, you know, of course you cut down on some of the experimentation if you believe they are not aligned to the longer term strategic visions. Uh, you become extremely focused on, on what are the top three, four uh, business metrics you want to deliver for the long term growth of the organization, for your investors or for the shareholders. Uh, and obviously, your, your focus on productivity or efficiency uh, improves a lot, which helps you set up the right structure to scale as and when you have the next round of funding or more liquidity in the market. Yeah. Recently, uh, various uh, corporate governance issues have been surfaced in the startup sector. And uh, managing risk is one of the part of it. So do you think that this uh, mitigating uh, risk is a hindrance in building the next uh, Indian corporation uh, relating to these startups? Thank you. I think partly that question has already been answered. Uh, it's not a hindrance. 
any sort of control. So one of my business leader once explained me, uh, a lot of us in room and not in room, but larger ecosystem believes that controls put breaks or as a hindrance to growth. The one line he explained me is treat controls as breaks. Breaks helps you accelerate. They do not stop you. Right? If you do not have those controls, you'll be very wary of accelerating your growth trajectory. So you know when to put controls, when to remove those controls, and that's why those are necessary to accelerate or stop your overall growth trajectory. So, see, whenever something grows at a very rapid pace, even let's talk about within our orgs, if there is a business which has grown at a very, very rapid pace, you will see things breaking, right? And then you build out controls to make sure nothing of that sort happens in future. So the startup ecosystem also went through a very, very rapid growth in the last one decade. And some of the controls the VCs are now building in to bring out, bring in the right set of reporting mechanism and their understanding around if there is anything going wrong in the organizations. So it will get settled in a year to come. Uh, I do not see this to be a very, very large challenge for the growth of startup ecosystem. Thank you, Mr. Bansal, and thank you, audience, for your question. So, uh, you know, we are coming towards the end of our session. So, uh, you know, when we talk about the new India Inc. or Next India Inc., it's not just the startups who are entering the fore, but it's also the established and mature company that are there. So, you know, in that context, uh, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Chug that, you know, what are the lessons that a mature company can learn or unlearn? you know, uh, from unicorns to survive uh, the changing world? Uh, I think let, let me start by saying that there's still a lot which, which startups, unicorns can learn from traditional companies, you know, in terms of long-term uh, sustainable planning, uh, having patience in, you know, building the business and, you know, having conviction in building that business. Uh, but of course, you know, it, it's a two-way process. Uh, I think one of the things which, which I believe is, is essential is that, that you know, which I've seen at a lot of, lot of good startups is, you know, asking for audacious, uh, you know, asking for the impossible. Uh, and I've seen a lot of these startups, you know, setting up audacious goals, enabling the, the ecosystem, the organization to, you know, uh, to deliver on those goals uh, and, and define the way, you know, the growth has been defined, right? 30% growth, phenomenal growth. 30% uh, annual growth used to be a phenomenal growth in any traditional organization. But when you're talking about 30% growth or 40% growth every month, it's just a very, very different world and requires a very different uh, kind of growth mindset. Uh, so as to say, it, it, you know, pushes for innovation. Uh, it pushes for the talent to, you know, rise uh, beyond what, what they're capable of. It pushes for the, the ecosystem to grow, to support that growth. Of course, you know, there have to be guardrails. There are at time downside to these bits as well. But your ability to, to ask for the impossible, not settle for, you know, what has been a historical growth rate, for example, or what has been achieved historically, is something which uh, a lot of, lot of uh, you know, traditional companies can learn from the startups. All right. And what about you, Mr. Bansal? What are the lessons that you would uh, tell, uh, what are the lessons uh, that mature company can learn and unlearn in the changing world? I think, first of all, there is a lot to be learned from mature setups uh, for startups, right? Uh, and the recent investment climate has proven that very, very clearly of where we, where the startups were going wrong and where cross correction is needed. But I think there are certain softer aspects which mature companies can look up to uh, for startups. I think the first one being uh, agility. Be agile, be nimble, enable quick decision making. How quickly you can do it is essentially you will then have, I would say, more satisfied employees and will help you to retain those best of the talents. Uh, the second is around innovation. I think if you look at the top 10 global companies, more than 50% of them are tech companies. And they've risen to that in the last decade or last two decades. 
So continue to innovate your product. Uh, and see what the customer wants and deliver it in the best possible manner. Make your customers love your product versus customers liking your product. We all love iPhones, right? There is a Android out there. We like, I, let me put it there. We like Andro Android phones, but we love iPhones. So that's the classification of saying, how do I innovate and bring out the best of the products which my customers like? And third is slightly, I would say controversial, but uh, uh, accept failures. I think if you're not failing, means you're not taking adequate risks. If you're taking adequate risks, you're bound to fail. And what Mr. Uh, uh, Raghun also mentioned that in Amazon, they do not penalize people if there is an error, right? They tell where the correction needs to be done. So similarly, if there is a failure, it, it will come along with a lot of learnings. Use those learning in your next venture or in the existing product which you are doing. Yeah, those would be two or three learnings I think uh, larger ecosystems can take from startup. Thank you so much. And now let's go to a mature company uh, finance chief and ask him that, you know, in the era of dynamic change, what are the imperatives to succeed and more than that sustain in the next India Inc? And uh, what will be your advice to budding CFOs uh, for shaping up and becoming the part of next India Inc? So, uh, the way the environment is changing and you know, we are facing all new challenges around, like, like three years back, nobody would have uh, seen a situation like COVID would happen. We all would be locked up in homes and you know working from home, and that was for a mature companies. Uh, for mature companies, it was not. It was not. It was very new to do uh, things like you know even from a finance perspective, uh, closing of accounts, and it all happened during the month of March and April and May, which we used to burn you know lot of midnight oil in offices around that time. So these kind of situations are coming up, and we have to be very uh, agile in adaptive to all these situations. Uh, that is something because the things might change, and we never know that. Uh, the COVID, how it will turn up in future, what new kind of situations may come up. And uh, while, you know, just I heard uh, my, Ashish, my fellow panelist, Ashish and uh, Sumit also, uh, the, what we can learn from the startups. So that is the energy or the agility which we can pick up from the startups, learn from them. And uh, it is a learning for not only for a mature company or for a fellow startup, for, but for everyone how to do it. Uh, for uh, you know, for other CFOs, like you know, what uh, my my message would be because what I have seen in my experience is that uh, focusing only on a particular aspect of the business is not sufficient enough. We have to look overall things, you know, uh, be it finance, be it legal, be it compliance, governance, fundraising is part of it definitely. But you know, uh, partnering with the CEO and uh, you know. Uh, rather than just implementing the strategy, formulating the strategy itself right from the beginning and uh, you know, co-piloting it along with uh, the CEO. And that's what actually helps. And uh, where it has happened, we have seen people, uh, the CFOs, actually succeeding in the steps of the CEOs later, which always is you know, good for a professional. That's what everybody aims for. So that's what I would like to. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your lessons. Thank you for your advice for the budding CFOs. Uh, with this, uh, uh, we have come towards the end of our session. Thank you so much for listening to us.